Hey, hello and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, coming to you live and direct from Makapu'u Beach. That's the scenery behind me with Rabbit Island in the background. And uh, this is my two bit to uh, get, get you to come to Hawaii and have a vacation. Um, this is Makapu'u in the middle of winter or the winter surf. And just for some perspective, we're, we're up about 200 feet above a cliff that looks down on the ocean. And those waves that are right around my left ear uh, on the right side of your screen are about 10 to 15 feet on the front. Um, they're not little tiny waves. They're actually pretty huge waves. And it's a great place to go body surfing and, and um, boogie boarding. That's where I grew up doing my surfing when I was a kid. So here's my pitch for the Hawaiian Visitors Bureau. Come see Hawaii. Beautiful place. Anyway. Today's show is a little bit about hydrogen safety. I want to talk about some hydrogen safety stuff. And I have a, a video that was done, actually done, I think, around four or five years ago, based on the age of the, the people I see in the, in the pictures. Um, but it's a really good video done by Paul Pontio, um, featuring Paul Pontio on, from Blue Planet Research. And he's actually giving a demonstration of, of hydrogen from a safety perspective, this demonstration has been given to several hundred firefighters, um, especially here in Hawaii, but also on the mainland, uh, to tell them what it's like to deal with hydrogen as a combustible fuel in a fire, particularly in a transportation fire. And this demonstration just kind of shows some of the interesting aspects of hydrogen that most people don't think about. And maybe they read about hydrogen on Google or or on the uh, on the internet, and they hear things like um, the flame is invisible, and things like that that scares people. Like they could walk into a hydrogen flame and not ever see it, and, and burn themselves to death and instantly. And how it gives hydrogen some negative connotation. So we're gonna we're gonna dispel those. And what I what I wanted to talk about today with hydrogen and and safety is, you know, hydrogen is a way to store energy. Um, and it's a way we store energy for transportation for electric vehicles. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are electric vehicles. That's the first thing you got to know. Hydrogen is just used in what's called a fuel cell. And if you're familiar with wet cell batteries and dry cell batteries, and they also have fuel cells. And fuel cells are self-charging batteries. So a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle uses hydrogen and air to make electricity in the fuel cell. Just like a battery gives you electricity from a dry cell or a wet cell, uh, hydrogen makes electricity in a fuel cell to provide power to motors. And electric motors are obviously much cleaner than internal combustion engines, uh, extremely powerful, react extremely quickly, so you get off the line quick, and um, pollution free, no carbon and stuff. But hydrogen in particular scares a lot of people. They think it's unsafe. They think it's unsafe because of the videos they've seen of the old Hindenburg um, catching fire and they get worried about H-bomb, hydrogen bombs, like could this thing blow up and things like that. Well, number one, the Hindenburg is actually a very complex uh, aviation event. And the, the, the folks, including folks from NASA who have, have looked at that, that scenario and what happened, um, they found out that really hydrogen probably had more to do to save lives on the Hindenburg than actually hurt people. For example, the, the covering of the Hindenburg is actually some kind of aluminized paint, which was meant to protect the fabric on the Hindenburg, which and the fabric was used to be lightweight so that they could have a more buoyant uh, Zeppelin. Unfortunate side is the covering, that, that metal, metallic covering that kept a uh, reflected heat and, and light and also protected all that fabric was highly flammable. In fact, chemical compound would be a lot closer to thermite, which is an explosive than to the typical paint that we see at uh, the hardware store today. And so when the Zeppelin was approaching the, um, the towers in New Jersey, um, the one thing you notice is they let all the lines down and that's to help ground the airplane. And you let the lines uh, hit the ground first so that um, the, the electricity the static electricity that builds up will hit the ground and discharge. So anyway, uh, in the Hindenburg's case, those grounds, those lines hadn't touched the ground yet. 
And the, as they approached, um, a lightning storm was also happening, and it struck the Hindenburg, discharged, and caught the skin of the Hindenburg on fire. And as the fire started spreading, because that, that material on the, on the, uh, in the paint actually is highly flammable, and it's going to keep burning unless you get an extinguisher up there. And obviously on the top of the Hindenburg, you're not going to have people with fire extinguishers. So once it started burning, it actually started burning aggressively and burned through the skin of the Zeppelin itself. And also because of the radiant heat burned into the bladder storing the hydrogen. And as soon as that hydrogen started to release, it added fuel to the fire. And therefore, you have the big fireball that you see in the pictures of Hindenburg. But that's where the story gets kind of interesting. If it wasn't for the hydrogen, which is much lighter than air, um, starting to burn and pulling, pulling the heat away from the passengers in the gondola underneath the Hindenburg, many more people would have been burned to death in the incident. As it is, as the hydrogen started escaping out of the top and burning, um, the Hindenburg, of course, settled down to the earth. And when it did, um, the heat from that fire was drawn away and above and taken out the top by the hydrogen. And so when the, in, when the gondola hit the ground, the people actually had time to escape. And the, the folks that died in the Hindenburg, most of them died jumping out of the gondola thinking they were going to burn to death. And if the people stayed in the gondola and got close to the ground, they actually had a chance to make it. So the folks that survived actually were able to survive because they stayed in the Hindenburg uh, until it got close to the ground. And then they jumped out and ran away before the rest of the Hindenburg came down on top of the gondola. So that's something that most people don't really think about in terms of that incident. Um, but it's what we'll explore today. So when whether you're talking about gasoline or propane, or diesel fuel, or bunker oil, or batteries, or, or any other way of storing energy. You have to have consideration for the power in that energy. Now, energy and power are different in definition, and that energy is the ability, gives you the ability to do work, and power is the work times time. So when you have power, you can take that energy and spread it out and control it like in an engine to give you acceleration in a car. Or you can take all the energy and release it at once and then you have an explosion like in a uh, kinetic bomb of some kind. But then hydrogen bombs are a whole different story. That's, that's a whole different side of physics that we don't deal with in the hydrogen we're talking about today. Uh, for using in transportation. We're not talking about fusion or fission or any other kind of nuclear reaction. But when it comes to any kind of energy storage, you have to always treat it with respect. I think people would be amazed when they learn exactly how many fires happen in gasoline stations when people are pumping gasoline and there's a static spark that sets off fuel at a, like a, a small five-gallon tank they're filling up or something or in their car because they're, they get a discharge from their phone or a static, static spark or something from themselves. There's actually quite a few, and it doesn't make the news a lot. But you, when it comes to any kind of energy, you have to treat it with respect. Um, Tesla vehicles are a classic example. We have great lithium cobalt technology and, and batteries now that are just amazing in how much energy they can store. But if you happen to disrupt the continuity of those batteries with a, by, you know, the, the Tesla runs over a big piece of metal or something or gets in an accident and ruptures some of the cells in there, um, they can start releasing that energy immediately. And quite frankly, it looks like an explosion and it catches fire. And it's a really, really hot, very um, intense fire. And that's all the energy being released from those batteries all at once. So no matter what kind of energy source you're talking about, whether it's batteries or gasoline or, or, or any kind of fuel, if you don't tear it with respect, you can pay the price. Now, fortunately for us, the technology that's used in, in battery vehicles is, is pretty well uh, contained and safe. 
It's just in really nasty accidents that you have an issue with those batteries. But most of the time, they're they're perfectly safe, just like gasoline vehicles. And as long as you're just driving it, you don't ram it into a, a big tree or something, they're pretty safe. But any vehicle that ruptures its fuel tank, a little spark, and you can set that gasoline into a big fire. So what do you have to do with hydrogen to be more safe and secure? Well, number one, we designed the tanks specifically for hydrogen. And you'll see some of these tanks as you as you look at the video, you'll see a small one. Um, but the tanks that are made to hold hydrogen in vehicles are specially designed to be extremely uh, sturdy in terms of holding pressure because the hydrogen is stored at, at very high pressure, and in some cases up to 10,000 pounds per square inch, which is, I mean, a scuba tank is 2,500 pounds per square inch, so a 10,000 pounds per square inch is you know, four times the pressure of a scuba tank. But those tanks are very robust. The, the, the tanks are metal cores with um, carbon fiber wrapping and, and resins that keep the tank from literally turning into a bomb or fragmenting and exploding. Um, and the valves that are built into them are meant to release pressure on an impact or if there's overpressurization in the tank. So even if the station could overpressurize your, your tank in your car, your car would release that pressure and wouldn't let the tank overpressurize. Or if uh, the car was in a fire, maybe the, 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 uh, the fuel cell car ran into a big tanker truck full of fuel, maybe that fuel uh, catching on fire could heat the car up so much that it would expand the hydrogen in the tank. Well, the car will actually release the hydrogen if the pressure gets too high as a safety issue. Um, another thing that's interesting is that hydrogen, when it's stored in its pure state, 100% pure, we call it 99.999, 59 purity, um, that's a requirement. Uh, the standard set in the industry for fueling vehicles is 99.999% pure hydrogen. At that purity, hydrogen is non-flammable. So when it's in the tank, it can't burn. When it comes out of the tank, if it mixes with air, um, it can burn. So the idea is if you have the hydrogen in the tank, even under pressure, if somehow something like a rifle bullet could penetrate the tank, it would release the hydrogen and the hydrogen would come out in a, in a jet and you can hear it. it. It would be really, really loud, like freight train loud. And if there was a spark that could ignite that hydrogen with the right mixture of air, if it could ignite, it would turn into a, like a blowtorch. And anything that wasn't in the direct line of that blowtorch would not be heated up. And we're going to show you this video here shortly. And when I bring it up, I'm going to let Paul Pontio explain some of the heat characteristics of hydrogen. So this is my friend Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research. Let's tell some of the myths about hydrogen because most people are afraid of hydrogen. Most people think it's the most explosive thing on the planet and that if you have a small leak in a hydrogen system, then it's just destined to explode and burn the building down. Well, the reality is, is that since it's the lightest element in the universe, it's 14 times lighter than air. It goes up at 45 miles an hour when it's let loose. That's 66 feet a second. So think about it going 1,001 and it's six stories away from it. It's gone. And because of that, it's very difficult to get a concentration that's flammable at the source of a leak unless you're right at the leak source. And what we do in the classroom is we do it by showing this. So you got a really audible major leak of hydrogen. It's blowing out right now like crazy. And most people would think if there's a spark, it's going to blow up. Well, it'll blow the flame out if I get close enough to it right now. It won't ignite until I get down closer to where it's concentrated enough. But as it's leaking out, it's hitting the ceiling of this building and it's going out that vent. So before I lit it, the hydrogen that had leaked out had already left the building. It's gone. It's moving really, really fast. So the other cool thing about hydrogen is that since there's no carbon in it, it's just purely hydrogen. And it's a little windy in here. But there's no radiant heat. And because of that, you can put your finger about an eighth inch from the flame. And there's no heat. It won't burn. 
but above right here, it's, it's 500 degrees plus. It's very hot. And if you come here, you can actually put your hands over it, you can feel the humidity in the flame. It's making water vapor with the oxygen in the air. I'll turn it down a little bit. The other thing is the other big myth or misunderstanding, it's not a myth, is that hydrogen is invisible when it burns. Well, it is outside. So if we took this in the sunlight, you wouldn't see the flame. But indoors and in sub subdued light, it burns orange. At nighttime, it burns bright orange. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I can get really, really close. And this tubing will actually, it's actually colder than room temperature right here. It's, it's hot by the jet, but it's pulling the heat out of the air and cooling down. And this is a little carbon fiber tank. We used to run this off of a propane tank, which was kind of bulky and a pain. This holds twice as much hydrogen as that five gallon tank, but it's at 4,500 PSI. And it's actually a paintball tank. <laughs> you said it was how much? A hundred and what? hundred bucks? How much? Yeah, about a hundred. With the regulator, it's about $125, $130. So they have a nice miniature <coughs> regulator. This is a super low pressure one, it puts out 275 PSI, which is very close to the propane tank. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can feel the, the moisture. And I used to have a pot to show. But what's cool about that is if you barbecue with it, mm -hmm. it doesn't dry your food out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. The other thing that to, to notice about the lack of radiant heat, you know, the significance of it is that if you have a fire at a fueling depot where you've got lots of hydrogen tanks stored, they're not going to heat each other up and start cascading into explosion. It's just going to go up and burn itself up. And that's usually the, the preferred method of dealing with the hydrogen fire. Just let it burn out. Put it out with water or something else like that. Then you've got hydrogen gas ready to ignite again. So you don't want to do that. Just let it burn out. And, and the cars and trucks all have a thermal release valve that will basically dump all the contents in less than a minute. So if, 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 it, if, it, if it senses enough heat, it will actually open the vent. And let it really. But the heat goes straight up. So if you had a hydrogen leak in a set of tanks, mm -hmm. it would be more like a torch than like a, a torch. billowing flame. Right. And so that, and that probably that torch would be a foot or so above the tank yes. by the time the, the air mixture is right to ignite. And so it would actually be above the tank with, with no radiating heat. So much safer than... Yeah, there's a famous video on YouTube that shows a hydrogen fire coming out of a fuel cell leak on the car right out of the trunk. And the windshield rubber on the back didn't even get melted or burned. Right. And, and you can see that here. And to demonstrate it more, this has got half the time that this has on it, but it was used with propane. Mm -hmm. So you can see how oxidized the finish is on there. This, this is freshly new. And there's a lot of heat in there. It can get really hot. So it's, it's, it's hotter than propane. I'm going to stop the video there. <clears throat> and thank Paul Poncio for, for letting us uh, look, watch the demonstration. It's really a great demo to watch up close and to put your hand right next to that flame. Uh, the picture that we have now up there is uh, a picture of actually a burner that I made um, out of some copper tubing and some fitting uh, just to experiment on the size of the openings because um, the burners have to be developed differently than regular propane burners. Um, because the holes have to be smaller, and you don't let the hydrogen mix with air before it goes to the to the burner. You have to literally just let the air mix after the, the gas escapes from the burner. So this is basically a homemade burner. And then the next picture I have is a professionally made burner that, that Paul built that shows how good a flame you can get for cooking, uh, like in a stove or something. If you really wanted to make hydrogen power, a hydrogen powered stove in your house um, to cook with, you could not only use the hydrogen to store the energy to make electricity, but you could use the hydrogen for cooking and also from, uh, for heating your water and things like that. So this has been just a quick um, review of, of hydrogen itself as a, as a safety thing. Um, again, so long as you um, keep the hydrogen, respect the hydrogen, 
um, use the proper safety equipment, store it in the proper type tank. Um, it, it's just as safe as any other. And if it does escape from its container, it doesn't hang around the ground where it can soak into your clothes and catch you on fire. It goes up in the air and it's gone to make cloud. It's non-toxic as a gas. So if it does escape, you're not letting a bunch of toxic fumes in the air. You're letting some of nature out to make more water and more clouds. So that's a, a little bit of hydrogen safety. Now what I'd like to do is just kind of talk to you a little bit about some of the things that have been going on, some hydrogen news. Um, this one I found myself, it's, uh, it says, it's from Reuters, a uh, new service, and it comes out of Paris, uh, July 6th, which is today. It says the Hyvian, H-Y-V-I-A-N hydrogen venture between car maker Renault and the U.S. company Plug Power will start selling products throughout Europe and will assemble fuel cells and hydrogen fueling stations at the Flins factory in France in late this year, 2020, uh, 2021. Um, these, this next series, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to read stories. I'm just going to read headlines because I think the headlines will give you a clue and you can look these things up and search for them on the internet if you're more interested in them. But I think just the headlines will give you a flavor for how much is going on in the hydrogen world right now. These uh, head, headlines are from the California Fuel Cell Partnership and Keith Malone. Uh, building a green economy, government of Canada is requiring 100% car and passenger trucks to be zero emission by 2035, um, and that includes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The world's largest green hydrogen plan um, to tap 45 gigawatts of wind and solar is being built in Kazakhstan. Um, so this isn't just a for rich countries thing. This is all the countries in the world are starting to get into hydrogen. South Korea. It's got H2 Mobility on the mind, and it says H2 Mobility plus Energy Show um, is going to showcase the future for the hydrogen industry, and it's going to be held at uh, Kintec in September of 2021. So look up Kin Kintec, K-I-N-T-E-X, if you want to get tickets for that. Um, the Global Green Hydrogen Pipeline is uh, exceeded 200 gigawatts. Um, there are 20, 24 of the largest scale projects uh, going on around the world to help contribute to that large scale um, production and transportation of, of hydrogen. Green hydrogen from floating floating wind adds up for Europe, even in the Middle East. Even the Middle East uh, imports are cheaper. Um, this story talks about some of the hydrogen in Norway and the North Sea that is being produced from North Sea wind and is able to be produced and used cheaper than buying imported oil and stuff from the Middle East. Buses and trucks, hydrogen fuel cells and batteries are being um, united um, to, to help address climate change. Joint call uh, by the Renewable Hydrogen Coalition and Hydrogen Europe, a revised RED2 should unlock the integration of more renewable energy by increasing renewable energy targets, removing regulatory barriers, and improving the regulatory environment. So that's an intergovernmental effort to help uh, batteries and hydrogen uh, gain use in the transportation sector and in, on grid. Racing for hydrogen, how gas giants are vying to stay relevant. Um, you'll find if you look at the whole energy industry, there are a lot of natural gas and oil companies they're investing in hydrogen right now because they see it as the future. Hyundai Electric City fuel cell bus begins testing in Europe. Um, how mirrors could power the planet and prevent wars. And that's uh, using solar power to concentrate heat to make uh, electricity and energy. Uh, Mayor launches England's first hydrogen double-decker buses in England. A consortium successfully increased support for fuel cell electric vehicles and uh, buses. I forget where that was at. Uh, Nikola Motors, if you're uh, familiar with them, invested $50 million in a Wabash Valley resources to produce clean hydrogen in the Midwest for zero emission Nikola trucks. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Nikola Motors, um, they were uh, one of the early companies that, that actually produced a prototype, several prototypes, and I think they're into the pilot truck mode now, of uh, vehicles that can go 1,000 miles 
on a fill-up of hydrogen uh, fuel, and they've developed a lease system that includes the fuel. They're going to be building hydrogen stations across the U.S. and trying to do long-haul trucking with these very efficient and apparently uh, even taking into account the cost of producing the hydrogen on their own, um, they're able to do it and save money and clean up the environment compared to using diesel, uh, the diesel trucks we use now. Uh, Mansion-led committee put forth a sprawling energy infrastructure proposal. Uh, land, sea, and air. GM plans to expand the fuel cell business beyond EVs. I think I talked about that um, on one of my last shows. BMW starts Europe's European road test for hydrogen fuel cell cars. Uh, GM technology could help commercial jets um, shed two tons of weight at takeoff. Uh, so that's that's from the California Fuel Cell Partnership, but I also got a, an individual one from a friend of mine. There's a company in California that's already starting to gin up business, and they have solved the energy storage, um, hydrogen energy storage um, for aircraft. And they've got modular, basically modular tanks that are roll on, roll off, so that instead of having to refuel tanks on the airplane, when the airplane pulls in and it's loading cargo and stuff, they would just basically pull off the old hydrogen tanks, slide in the new hydrogen tanks and connect them up. And now the plane's ready to go. And it makes the fueling much safer and much quicker. Uh, and it's being incorporated on several of the aviation projects that are currently in the works. And you'll be flying on probably in the next 10, 15 years. Um, Cal Ohio Fuel Cell Partnership had a couple of great stories. Volvo vows to make hydrogen fuel cell construction equipment a thing. Clean Technica interview. So that's from Clean Technica. Um, and Volvo, by the way, makes heavy equipment, construction equipment. They're into hydrogen. I already know of one uh, electric um, caterpillar that's going to be converted to a hydrogen fuel cell here in Hawaii pretty soon. A truly sustainable transport sector must incorporate fuel cells. That's from Automotive World. The mayor of London launches the first buses, double deck buses. I talked about that before. Lieber and GM to develop Hydrotech fuel cell based electrical power generation system. That's from Aerospace Manufacturing. From Stam Stanford Health, new newly okayed fuel cells could power 88% of the Tully Health Central op Center operation. And that's from the Fairfield Citizen publication. Two German operators to run uh, in service trials for Hyundai's electric city fuel cell buses. That's in ET Auto. Um, Aramco sees major hydrogen marketing uh, forming amid historic pressures as they test big oil. And that's from CNBC. Um, let me see. There's a couple more stories here. Uh, this one Norway, Norway's Strackcraft is lined up to provide green hydrogen for an 88 meter long zero emission ship. And that was also on CNBC. As you can see, there's a lot going on and we're really happy here in Hawaii that one of the bills, Senate Bill 934, this got signed into law and it actually takes away one of the barricades to selling hydrogen to vehicles. I'm really happy to see this bill and I wanna send out a big mahalo to the legislature for passing it and getting it through and the governor for signing it. This will make a huge difference in the local market for getting hydrogen fuel cell vehicles really adopted in the state of Hawaii. And I'd encourage other states to look at that bill and adopt it as well to help relieve some of the pressures of uh, getting, getting hydrogen fuel metered and dispensed. So that's going to about do it for Stan the Energy Man today. And I appreciate you uh, joining us, being with us. And um, Come out to Hawaii. That's the waves back there are waiting for you. So just grab your boogie board and come on out. It's a good time. Until next Tuesday, aloha.